I was not supposed to be here, actually. Um, uh, the speaker that that wanted to come here had an inconvenient, so I'm covering him. Uh, this is pretty much improvised, but I do have a lot of knowledge of Cake Three, so this is not at all improvisation for me. Uh, I think part of the KPHP framework for perhaps more than six years, and I've been using Cake since 2005, so that's a long time. So thank you to Cake DC. This is the company, a consulting company, that actually sponsored my travel here to cover James. Uh, they've been really nice uh, trying to, to take the word out about KPHP and, and, and perhaps developing new good practices for the framework and, and being more open with the rest of the community. So some thumbs up for them. And also, thanks to my company, this is a cliche, of course, we're hiring. <laughs> but really, uh, if you allow me like 10 minutes to talk to you and convince you, you probably would like to work there. Uh, it's a startup in Copenhagen. Uh, we're not afraid of technology, and we're moving fast, so we want more people. Bounty, uh, lend me part of my time, I guess. <laughs> to come here and talk to you for a couple days. I'm gonna be here in, on Saturday for the workshop. And yeah, that's the sponsor's part. So the agenda. What are we gonna learn today? What are we gonna talk about today? Let's start, before doing the agenda, who has worked with Cake in the past? Okay, that's a lot of people, more than I expected. Who? is not working with Cake now, the majority. <laughs> and, and that's expected, and that's actually, most of my talk is to talk about, about that. And uh, probably at the end of the talk, we're gonna discuss some uh, action plans to reverse that decision that you have, <laughs> that you have made. Uh, but no, really, uh, more than selling the framework, I want you to give you an overview of how projects evolve why perhaps something that is super popular is not popular anymore, and why the experience of something that was very popular and not popular anymore can actually uh, be of benefit to you and something that you can use in your current project. So first, a short story. We're gonna talk about docs. That's my favorite part. A brief overview of KPHP 3, a note and collections. We're gonna talk about my, oh, I have a typo. That's so usual on me. Uh, we're gonna talk about the ORM, that's my brainchild, and we're gonna get baking. So a short history, uh, KPHP is perhaps the oldest framework in PHP. How many of you knew that? So you were probably wearing diapers at the time. <laughs> at, 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 least, at least programming diapers, okay? I'm saying probably, I'm not saying that that's the case. Okay, you can see a commit history. That's when we moved to GitHub. GitHub was open perhaps in 2008. So we were there before. We moved everything from a SVN repo with a automated tool. Uh, we don't see more commits here because a, is he Dutch? Or no, a German guy. He deleted everything from SVN. So, <laughs> so. Yeah, that's a German. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we had to start from uh, commit one <laughs> again. He, he thought that by using SVN submodules that he was doing a nice thing, so he did SVN remove everything for his own project, and he committed that. <laughs> yeah, it's not as good as Git now. So yeah, you can see that, the, that this is contributor activity by commits number of contributors by time, cake is actually increasing. So as for something that has been going on for such a long time, it's impressive to see that it keeps going and going and going. And we could say that KPH is more than a grown up now. It's probably a grandpa of the, of the, of the frameworks, or we could call it the oldest duck in the pack. And that brings me to ducks. 
and we're going to talk about the type of dog. And we have the first type of dog, which is the fat one. So what I'm talking here may or may not relate to your favorite framework. <laughs> may or may not relate to KPHP as well. So the fat dog is one that all people make fun of them because they're fat. Don't do that. You probably got sold in, got told in school to not make fun of fat people. Yeah, right? Don't make fun of dogs that are fat as well. We have another type of dog, which is a slim one. No pun intended to slim PHP, of course. Uh, <laughs> this <laughs> slim dogs are interesting and horrible at the same time. And, and we come to a point where you wonder, is this still a dog? What animal is this? Right? So there's another type of dog, which is a hyperactive one. <laughs> it's like me, 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 right? Look at me. I have so many shiny things to show you. <laughs> so many new features. <laughs> you probably know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> so what is interesting is that <coughs> Sorry, is that most of those type of dogs, KPHP has been in the past. And that happens to probably every framework or probably any software uh, project out there. So there's a final type of dog as I see it. Oh no, that's not the final, sorry. Uh, there's a cool one. It's a variation of the new kit or, or the hyperactive one. It's a, do you know this character? That's my favorite character in all the cartoon world. It's called Party God. Party God is from uh, Adventure Time. It's just a floating head that goes to parties. That's it. <laughs> and he's awesome, right? Everyone wants to be him. Everyone wants to party with him. And no one ends good at the end of the chapter. They usually disappoint, right? They, they try to sell you a lot of stuff. They're really cool. They're really fun. But they don't deliver at the end. And the final type of talk, I think, uh, now back to the framework talk, I think there are two frameworks that have come to that level, and I would say that Symfony and Cake, that's the good old one. The good old one is one that has gone through many adventures and still look great, at least to some. So. Uh, you can see, perhaps if you could graph the popularity or visibility of a framework over time, you could see that they all have a huge spike at the beginning because they're hype, they're shiny, they're new, they're hy hyperactive. And then this comes this like depression in which uh, people will say, well, it was not as cool, it doesn't cover my need as well. I tried to use the wrong tool for the job, I tried to, uh, I mean, they had a hammer, so everything looks like a nail. And then comes like a new plateau of productivity where people that actually found what was a framework intended for and also the developers that were developing the framework I said, well, what the framework is good for is for this and not for everything, right? So usually the visibility of the framework stays at a state level perhaps, uh, but it's one in which the people is completely or, or at least very productive with it. And I would say this is the stage where KPHP is. So now, 2015, why choose KPHP 3? Before I go there and you don't read my slides, why use a framework that is so old, apparently, uh, in 2015? I'm not continuing without an answer. Maturity, Maturity yes. It's battle tested. Uh, you have the guarantee that it's going to keep on in the future. If something has a track that is going on, uh, you could say, well, it's probably going to be there for a longer time. It's not going to disappear. It, it has momentum, exactly. It has more experienced developers, exactly. Uh, and it usually has like a nicer community. Uh, if you look at communities that have been going longer, well, it's not 
true for every case, but communities uh, tend to have a core amount of people that steal the skills for communicating to the rest of community and still be good at it. Uh, so well, at this point, KPHP is a very, very mature framework with a lot of experienced developers uh, that you're not putting features in because that's his job. Uh, none of us get paid to develop the framework. We're doing it because out of the experience that we get from our daily jobs, we say uh, what we did one year ago in Cake, that was stupid, remove. This is actually useful. Uh, in 2015, uh, because now it has a really extremely powerful and flexible ORM. Uh, that's actually three years of my life working on that framework, <laughs> uh, on the ORM, sorry. Uh, I will talk about the features that it has and how it compares to others. It doesn't have to be your favorite ORM or use it for everything. It caters to a special set of needs that I think that a lot of developers have uh, that is not covered by others in, in, in the way that it, this one covers it. Uh, still, it has a really simple and feature-rich uh, generator of code. Uh, internet, well, IATN, I cannot say that word correctly. <laughs> Internationalization. Uh, that actually makes sense. Uh, probably only one of the developers of KPHP is actually in native English speaking. So for all of us, IATN is key. So out of real examples in, in our daily lives, uh, we have to steal the features to make good IATN. Um, a middleware oriented stack, whatever hyper buzzword that means, uh, we have that too. <laughs> uh, but but in, in reality, it solves the 80% of the problem, and we have learned to stay out of the way. When, when the framework is not helping you, it actually helps you to say, okay, from now on, uh, you're on your own, and you can do the rest with your own tools, your own libraries, external libraries on Composer, for example. Uh, the framework is not going to interfere on that decision. And I think most, most importantly, it has outstanding documentation. I think that probably KPHP is the only framework that released betas of its software with full detailed documentation. For each beta that we release, we have full documentation of what we do, uh, with real life examples as well. So if you go to the documentation in K, you will find pages and pages of documentation that we keep refining so that it's not overwhelming. So something that we have been doing lately is to go on each of the chapters, someone reads it, and puts a summary on top. So what are you going to learn in this chapter? And you get like, the key examples. If you want more, you can keep reading. And it actually requires less code. So compared to other frameworks, which caters to another set of problems, you can write the same application uh, with less code and still be maintainable and still be flexible. So in 2015, you can actually use KPHP components. You don't like Cake as a framework, or you cannot switch to Cake as a framework? Well, use its components. We have quite a few, actually. I put on the top the ones that I consider that are the best or the most useful for, for the general PHP community. We have collection, we have database, we have the ORM. We have validation, we also have events, we have log, cache, but well, that's for internal consumption mainly. And here we have an example of collections. Has anyone ever worked with a functional language? Which? Haskell, right? Uh, which is like the best language for learning uh, functional uh, programming. So I, I fell in love with Haskell back in the day, a long time ago, and I always wanted to come back to that, to do a, a bit of functional programming on PHP, which is extremely hard, it's impossible. So I, I already dropped the idea. But I could bring some of the features that I like from functional programming into PHP, which is, for example, the, it's not called that, but for simplifying it, I call it the pipeline, pipeline pattern. 
So you have a set of data. It can be zero uh, amount of elements. It can be one. It can be 1,000. It can be 700 million of rows. It doesn't matter. It can cope with that because it's not going to consume more memory than it needs for each iteration. So the collections library in PHP, in KPHP, brings that uh, in a very simple and intuitive way in, 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 in which you can use uh, these patterns. So here, for example, you have an array. This supposedly, uh, suppose that it comes from the database, it's just a few rows. And you want to group those rows in three levels, first by the parent, then a key value, ID and name. So with that line of code, you can do that. And it does it in a way that it doesn't consume all the memory in the server if you have millions and millions of rows. Um, or for example, you can do functional style CSV generation. I do this every day in my job, so I actually needed this. This is a simplified version of a live working code. I select, uh, I think in that table, in the, this example, there were uh, 100 million rows tables. I, need to put, I need to, needed to generate quite a few CSV files. So I select from that. I, didn't, I wanted to have the title. So I have a closure for generating the title. I needed everything that had price more than zero. This generates the title and finally creates a file. Consum consumption of memory, constant. Any question about that? Map title with, sorry? Oh, uh, so yeah, sorry. I, I wanted to make it more easier to read. I renamed this variable and I didn't rename here, sorry. Yeah, good eye. Um, another question that is not related to typos. <laughs> <laughs> Or, uh, for example, uh, you have, this is actually your example, he pinged me today in the RRC with basically this same example. It's like, oh, this is part of my talk. Uh, you have an API that you can only fetch stuff sequentially uh, if, if it relates to different stuff, but at the end you want to produce a flat list. So what do you do? You have an unfold function yielding each of the commands that you need to use. Then you have a map that will call the API. You trim whatever has errors. You unfold again to flatten the list. And then at, at the end, you probably would have, if it's Yelp API, a list of locations from Denmark, Netherlands, France, uh, that relates to Italian, Japanese, and Chinese food. Like all the locations for all those countries in one single flat list. If you try to do that in uh, procedural code, it takes a lot more lines and it's not as modular. For example, I could comment whatever of the lines here or some of the times if you have iterative, like a lot of maps, you can either comment out or just change the order or extract that into another class if it's growing out of uh, the amount of lines that you allow in your file, for example. And uh, well, this is an example of um, my, fi my file is growing too much. I have way too much map filter functions. So I extract away some of the functionality into callable classes. And the code becomes extremely readable at the end. So you know that you have a collection of articles. Uh, this one is implements like a bad ORM where you have lazy loading. Uh, basically, well, for each article, if there's an author ID, then find the comments and inject into the article. The, the cool thing about this, even though it's a bad example, is that it does it once at a time, and it doesn't do, if you have 100,000 articles, it doesn't do 100,000 uh, queries at the, at the beginning of the, of the script. Do you understand how this works, or going too fast? No? The jury out there? <laughs> Good. Uh, well, for example, in, in this example, you can see that no queries have happened at this point. So collections 
on the return collection. They don't do anything. They just return an structure that when you start iterating, it will one at a time pass it to the handling function. That's what keeps the memory constant. And it also has a lot of useful real life methods. For example, you have a database structure that is like a tree of comments, but you have a flat because it's a relational database. So you call nest and it creates the tree structure. You have a tree structure and you want to put it in a flat list in your HTML, then you call list nest. Uh, you have millions of rows and you want to stop at some point iterating, so stop when? An index by and you have match for search and you have append. I think it has like 50 methods. Uh, the collections library. Uh, try it out. Just composer kphp slash collection. Uh, I think it's worth a try. And yeah, as I was saying, collections are like a pipeline of workers. So nothing happens until you iterate the next. So if you're familiar with how iterators work, you probably know how, it, how this works internally. So any questions so far? Is this boring to you? So let's jump a bit to the ORM. Before looking at examples, look at me. <laughs> um, what ORM do you use, if any? And perhaps cite one of your favorite features about your ORM and uh, why you use it, if you were forced to use it, do you hate the ORM? Is it difficult to work with sometimes? They all are. So, Propel. Do you like Propel because? Okay, code generation. Anyone else? What, you use Dotson because? You like Unity, you like Unity for it? Mm -hmm. So you like data mapper instead of Unity for it? Okay. Uh, anyone familiar with data mapper versus active record? Who's not familiar with that? So I can explain it quickly. Okay. Basically, the pattern that Propel implements and Eloquent from Laravel, or Rails, the active record, uh, is that you have a got class that represents at the same time a single row and the table. So you say, for example, articles in, in Ruby language, dot find, so uh, articles is a class, but when you fetch each of the results of, of the find, it returns the same article class. So it's kind of a recursive thing where you can, for the same article, then have the table uh, methods, right? So article have the same methods. So for the row you can call save, or inside this the row you can actually call find, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but uh, it's good for prototyping. I use active rep record for prototyping. Actually, Cake in the beginning had a very ill implementation of active record with the tools that PHP provided when it was PHP 4, so you can imagine. Uh, Data mapper, on the other hand, you have separate objects. We have one for table, and you have one for the rows, and they usually don't know about each other, especially the entity, which is the idea of a row, or an abstract idea that can be persisted in the database, uh, doesn't know anything about how it's persisted. And unit of work, which is a pattern that you can put on top of data mapper, is one in which you put all the entities inside this unit of work, inside this bag, and you call the unit, the unit of work, figure it out. Figure it out means like there are entities that need to be saved, some need to be deleted, some need to be updated, do it for me. Uh, has anyone else tried that screen? Uh, how does that work for you? It works well. So far, so good. 
<laughs> it works really good for a big chunk of applications. For other type of applications, we are a more like fast paced, in my view, uh, it doesn't work that well. Or applications in which the transactions take a long time. So you cannot wait to the end of the process to call flush or figure it out because whatever happened in the database, uh, it's happening so fast that when, when by the time that it keeps flush, uh, it's gonna be a bad thing. So I personally like working with SQL at a closer level. And that's how this ORM basically started. I, I actually started implementing like a bridge from Doctrine or with Doctrine and KPHP for version three and that ended pretty bad. Uh, first because it was not the philosophy of Kate. It was, was more like fast paced development. Doctrine was more like well this is this needs to be really well done, uh, well thought from the upstart. Uh, there were a lot of things that you cannot combine with each other. Uh, Doctrine didn't like to be extended at all. It's like use Doctrine or nothing. You cannot extend this. Um, so it was actually very painful. So I realized, well, what I like about working with databases. I like working with SQL. I actually enjoy very, very much writing my own SQL. But, it, but, but that's boring. It, it is boring to, to write SQL because it ends to be, uh, or tends to be repetitive. So what if I could write the SQL? I, I know exactly what is going on, but without writing it. So I can have some helpers combining stuff that could help me write the SQL. And by the time I say, okay, this is not working, I can go to just manual, right? And what else do I like? I like collections. So if we go back one slide, collections are lost. So how can we combine these two major sources of love together? and create a big explosion of energy and life. <laughs> no? Oh yeah. Well, basically the concept of collection is embedded into the ORM. And uh, I can show you how. So uh, this, I'm, I'm just gonna go like actually really fast over the ORM now. Uh, some of the principle is everything is an expression so you can put anything from the ORM inside any part, as long as it's an expression. So you can create subqueries by putting them in, the, in a join, in a where, in a select, in a union, everywhere. Uh, queries can be composed, so you have finders. Finders are just queries where you call methods on them, but if you call multiple times finds, queries start composing one with each other. Uh, queries are also collections, so this is a collection method, each. You can also call combine, nest, list nested, uh, unfold, etc. Uh, and queries, uh, well, basically here, queries also embed the concept of future work. Let me see if I have an example here. Uh, no, this is not the best example. This is more like how to filter with associations. Uh, have you ever tried to filter, for example, give me the articles that have a specific tag? So you have to go through the join table and then go there. So if you try that, uh, how, how do you use that actually? In SQL. It's a basic inner join. So it's impressive, impressive the amount of ORMs that do not do that. Uh, I'm gonna cite Eloquent. Uh, what they do for this kind of job is they do a subquery finding the tag instead of going directly to, the, to doing an inner join. So KPHP implements that. So you can do inner joins at infinitum so if you have a really big chain of associations, you can just say, well, match articles with tags dot something else dot something else dot something else. So if you have a chain of relationships that it goes really, really, really deep, it will figure out how to do the inner joins correctly. And if you say, well, 
you can go this deep, but from this deep level, which is also a many-to-many uh, -many relation, I want that information as well. So it cannot be in the same query. So it actually will change the query generation or the query planner to say, well, up to this part, I need to split into jobs and then do that. So uh, all that kind of boring stuff that you need to think, well, if I do the query, but here it will create duplicate stuff and, and so on uh, and on and on, uh, it will figure it out for you. So in this case, we have the cities that are bigger than Denmark. It's just a query here. Uh, you, you look for the Denmark population. And then you say, well, find, this is a find on the, on the countries table. Well, find countries matching cities where the population is more than this query. So it basically created an inner join where the condition is a subquery. Isn't that mind blowing? It is. <laughs> Um, and something that I was talking about before is that queries embed the idea of future work. So when this query is fetched, I want it to be grouped by something. So you actually can stack groups. So when you call a query, find something, find something, find something, if each of them say, well, in the future, when this query is fetched, the result, they will need to be grouped, sorted by, combined, uh, whatever, logged, reaching into a CSV for whatever. So you basically just call for mat result. Uh, it's, there's also a method called map reduce for doing future work. Uh, and you do whatever collection method you need to generate the, the final stuff. So basically when you do uh, the find in continent groups in a table class, and you fetch the result, you get this instead of entity. This is in JSON notation just for privacy. You get it right. And uh, for example, you can stack uh, future work. So for, for example here, find in regional groups, you create one future work for map result, you first group by, and then you again, add to the pipeline that for each of the continents that were grouped here, well, create a collection out of that continent group and group by region. And you have this result. Well, basically it's only one query. That's a, that's a magic. <laughs> that, that's a great magic of it. That uh, I really dislike uh, ORMs that do more than one query. So if it can do just one, I'm happy because I could do it uh, by hand, right? So why couldn't something automated do it? So in this case, it's just find, this would be, uh, yeah, this would be just a find on, on countries matching uh, cities probably and you do future work where it just groups by something. Well, sort of. Uh, it, it tries to not, not be extremely intelligent. It, you just basically say out, you break up, right? You just break it up in small pieces. For this small piece, I will need continents. So I will find, I create a query with continents and the future work is to format the result. And then there's a query that combines the other query and when the two uh, future work or future jobs are combined, they produce this. And there's more. Uh, there's also a map reduce routine. You can not call map uh, for map results, but you can call map reduce test to closure or two callables. And it will basically let you do, I'm not sure if you are familiar with map reduce, how it works. Um, no? Well, uh, in two words, is it process? <laughs> in a few words, um, 
It's a process of three parts. It's actually map, shuffle, reduce. Map is just something that iterates over all the results, telling this is interesting, this is interesting, this is interesting. And not only interesting, but interesting and goes in bucket A. This is interesting and goes in bucket B. This goes in bucket A, this goes in bucket B, this in C, and so on. There's another routine that takes over, which is reduce, and say, well, give me all the buckets, I will combine them in one result. So if you need something as, for example, this, well, this is probably a stupid example, but you have a, an article, and you want to create, or a list of articles, and you want to create a reverse index. So for each word in each of the articles, you want a list of the IDs of the articles in which that word appears. So you have a map job saying uh, the word the goes in bucket the. And you put the article ID one there. So the word kphp goes in the bucket kphp, you put article one, etc. So at the end of the reduce job, what it's gonna do is get all the buckets, which is basically a array of all the words with a list of uh, the articles in which they appear. They will concatenate that and just produce one single result. Is that clear? I see some faces like, <laughs> sorry for being so specific. Um, it has intelligent count operations. This is one of my favorite features. You have a query in which you do group by and you want to paginate that query. Is that a problem? It is a problem, exactly, because you cannot basically select uh, limit offsets in a group query. What you need to do is make that query into a subquery of the pagination. So PHP does that for you. Yeah, KPHP does that for you. Uh, complex pagination one liners, well, it, it figures out all those complex cases, like group by, if you cannot combine it with a subquery here, it just removes the subquery and puts it in, a, in another strategy. Uh, it has automatic saving as of, of associations, I'm surprised at the amount of frameworks that don't do that, and, and I'm amazed at the amount of hours people spend on, on doing it by hand. If you have a form with, I'm talking about Laravel here. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a form, for example. <laughs> with, uh, you have a form with, I don't know, a recipe with ingredients, and you want to save the ingredients and the recipe at the same time, you don't get each of the params in the form and put it in this, the, the, the structure that the ORM needs. You just basically say, hey ORM, here's my form, do it for me, save, thank you, bye. <laughs> so uh, KPHP is really good at that. Uh, it can, out of a form that you create in HTML, you don't need to uh, have any special tool except just HTML or perhaps a JSON, uh, if it's corrected, uh, correctly formatted or correctly nested, you just pass that to, to KPHP and securely it will create the entities for you and save them for you. If it's something missing, uh, or for example, if it needs to create a new association, it will do it for you or a new entity, or if it needs to update the entity or it needs to associate two entities, it does it for you as well. Result streaming, I work with a lot of data, millions and millions of rows, this is super important for me. Uh, I don't want all the entities in the world at the same time, I want one by one, you can do that in this ORM. Query caching, not my favorite feature, but a lot of people like to cache their queries. Uh, finder callbacks, we saw it here. Oh uh, no, finder callbacks is also, uh, you can, for a table, for example, you can have a before find. So if you want to implement a, a soft delete, you can say, well, if soft delete is enabled in this part of the application, I cannot see anything that has deleted equals one, right? It does that automatically as well. Uh, it supports composite primary keys, which is one feature that very, very, very few ORM support in the PHP land. I'm not sure if Doctrine does, probably does. So, okay, Doctrine is awesome. So I, I really praise Doctrine because it's really good. Uh, probably more complex than I like, but it's really good. 
<laughs> and uh, one thing that I, I, I like is that it has methods for finding in tree structures, which is something I work a lot with. Uh, you can find more examples of how the ORM is used in this repository. I have a full list like finders and how they are combined with uh, the result. And I have a SQL file that you can play with. Any questions about the ORM so far? Yes, actually we borrowed it uh, from things, things migrations. We actually created our own. It's embedded there. We, we needed it for our fixtures feature. So if you do database testing, we just have a flat file where you declare this is my schema, these are my rows, or this is where you can fetch my rows. And uh, for each test, it will drop the database or drop the table, fetch the rows, and so on and so on. But then we wanted a migration tool. Things was starting to be popular. We helped them a bit at the beginning, especially with a SQL driver, a SQL server driver. And uh, we're using that. So it has a schema generator using a third party library that we highly integrate into the framework. It's not like, well, use things and, and you're done. It's like we integrate it really good into the framework. So cool features from the framework can be used in combination with things. Um, before let's the baking part. Another question about the framework, the ORM. No, uh, no, I, 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 I didn't implement that feature. It could probably do it out of the association system. So uh, one of the features in the in the ORM is that you could create special types of association. So you create a class defining how something behaves, and it has all the methods that are called uh, when hydrating, when finding, when uh, deleting, etc. So it's possible, but personally, I think it's a problem that is so complicated to do correctly that I don't want to go there. Uh, when I started doing database work, I think that was like I need an ORM that can do that. But the more I have worked with SQL, the more I, the less I like that idea. Because you do table inheritance because you want your objects to be nice or you want your objects to, to not repeat themselves too much, right? You, you solve the problem of programming in your language by changing your, your database schema. And that's not how it's supposed to work. You should have a really good norm, denormalized, uh, sorry, normalized schema. And out of that, figure out how to represent that in, 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 your, in your language, which is the opposite that Doctrine does. Doctrine says, uh, let's imagine that all the databases in the world can be represented as a object tree structure or object graph structure, which is amazing if you could do that, but you cannot. You cannot treat a relational database as an object graph, in my opinion. Yes, thank you for for asking. <laughs> uh, one of the great features of the ORM is that it treats each of the types as something generic or abstract. So you can map columns to types. So you say, well, this column is a string in the database, but when fetching it, do it with this strategy. So for example, uh, a stupid example is a string, but do it with a JSON strategy. So you have a JSON object. Yeah. Exactly, and uh, another cool thing is that uh, it integrates really well with the framework, so it doesn't just fetch good, it also saves good, and also marshals good, which is the, the aspect of some ORMs that is not covered. So you have a form with, for example, a date, and the date needs to be localized because people want localized dates. So you post that, and the, the hydrator or the marshaller for that column knows, okay, we're using this locale in the system. I'm gonna parse that in that locale and convert it to the value object, which is the date time. It cannot, but I'm working on that because it's a common feature that I, I want covered. Even in 2.5? Yeah, okay. 
well, I'm, I'm working on that. It's, it's a complex problem. But one of the, oh, sorry, one of the ways I, I think it's possible is not with uh, hydrators or special type of columns, but with um, special type of relationships. For example, if you have a money value object where you have the currency and the value, and you need to fetch the currency from another table, you implement that as a special association. So it's a complex problem. I'm working on that actually. Yes? Question. Um, let me start with the second one, the, the benchmarks. Uh, there's a person in the team that is working on a benchmark repository benchmarking ORMs. I don't know. What I like doing is actually compare it to myself. So is it better than K2? K2 was super, super simple, right? You just direct results from TDO, here you have them. Like perhaps a bit of more of loop. So beating that is really really, really difficult. And the fun part is that it's almost at the same level, which is pretty impressive, considering that it needs to convert two objects, it needs to cast the value objects, and it casts a lot of iterative magic. So it's almost at that speed level. So I, I would consider that a major achievement. Uh, I, I don't have a uh, comparison to other projects, but I would say that it's 80% confident that it's faster than Doctrine. Doctrine does more work, that's for sure. Uh, work that is optional in K2. So if you want that amount of work that Doctrine does, you can have it, but it comes at the same time. Um, and your first question was? Um, about the code generation. Code generation. The runtime it doesn't do runtime inspection. Uh, the only thing that happens at runtime is that it inspects the database. So if you say use the articles table, it goes to the database, find the database, the, the table that is called articles, inspects all the columns, and now it knows, okay, well, this is a date time, this is a bar chart, this is a boolean. That's all we know. That's cached, actually. So it happens only once. You don't need to co-generate anything. We have a shell that does that once for you for a deploy, so if you don't want to that should happen on each deploy, uh, you do it before deploy. Uh, we have code generation as well. So you say, here's my database, create. Then it not, not only creates the table class, it creates the entity class, it creates a controller, it creates views if you want, it creates forms, it creates pagination, and you can have a REST API out of that if you want as well. But we don't need as much code generation as Doctrine does or Proper does. Because we don't depend on the classes. We can just say new case, wrong slash, or an wrong slash table. Uh, and you say, well, the table is going to use articles. Done. You figure out everything for yourself. Any other questions? No? I wanted to do this like kind of like live baking stuff. Like, don't have time, so I'm just going to run over the slides so you can see how, how this works. Okay? Um, installing KPHP is a line you already used to that. It's a composer. This is not needed anymore. Sorry? Yeah, this is, I, I did this, this part of the presentation. I don't know. Um, <laughs> this one. <laughs> and well, you just initialize a PHP server, the build tree server, and you have this nice web page. Let me see if I can go to that web page right now. Here. Server. Uh, 
I, I already implemented the logic. I just have to do the logging that we Right? So something <coughs> I wanted to show you is this nice bar. We call it the bucket. So we have insights of whatever is happening in your application. We have all the cache reads. We have stuff from the environment. We have history from previous requests. If you have to sync them, you probably know something similar to this. Uh, log, whatever is happening in the request, if it's whatever is happening in the session, SQL log, the profiler, SQL, SQL profiler, and the variables that have been sent to this. So, using things to create our database, this is our schema generation tool. We create our first two tables, bookmarks and text. So my grades, and now we automatically generate the tables of the database. We call these awesome commands. They all the things. And we basically have now a broad application. Uh, we create the users, etc. etc. Get your bookmarks, uh, have a new bookmark, uh, and you create a uh, Have a new bookmark. Okay, so the usual stuff. We have a admin interface with three commands. That was pulled in 2005. It's not pulled anymore. Um, and that's it. But not really. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the bucket that I already showed you, but we can also go to the next level. The next level is, that was cool in 2005, show me something that is cooler. So I want a REST interface without code. So for that, we have the CRUD plugin. So we slash CRUD, compose a required this plugin, we add the trait, which actually doesn't add any new methods to your controller, it just authorizes one method, in PHP. You initialize which uh, actions you want. You want index, add, drop, uh, edit, view, delete. You can delete any flow when it will not be implemented. Um, this is optional. You have a URL, for example, user slash one dot JSON. That's good for testing. Uh, add this component. And now I can go to, uh, let me repeat, there's no code in the application. Can show you. This is my user controller. There's nothing implemented. There's no view, add, delete, add anything. There's no text. There's no bookmark code except for uh, some customization that I'm going to talk about later. It all happens automatically. So, for example, if I do bookmarks dot JSON, this is for testing. You can request with application JSON header. We have an API. So you say, okay, that's awesome, but how do I customize? Um, oh, something that is cool that I wanted to show is um, that your API has debugging input. So that has all the queries that happen. And it also has pagination input. And pagination I'm giving up there. Um, authentication, I'm going to skip this part. It's basically like two lines. Catch the password, load off component. Now you have authentication in your API and your web page. This is a login action. It's quite simple, actually. Uh, permissions. Just adding one class. I'm not going to talk about that because time restrictions. Um, and this, this is important. Uh, how do I customize? It's in your so the component that we added is called Rod. Since I already implement, it already implements all the actions. You can actually override the actions that, but it exposes a lot of events that you can look to and say, well, before finding any bookmark, I always want the text 
on the root one. So you say, well, did the query contain the text, which is the year loading for test. And before paginating, I want to only show the bookmarks of that user ID. And uh, as before you say, I want to make sure that the entity user ID is always the logged in user. So, I mean, it's 2015, all the fraud stuff should go away, right? so repetitive that no one wants to do this anymore. But every cross stuff has custom stuff to do with it. Well, sometimes they need to put the user ID in, sometimes they need to add this, sometimes they need to do a special little message. Well, we have fallbacks for all that. Fallbacks that come from real life examples. And um, I maybe should stop and talk here. Can I make that longer? Sorry, <laughs> people want to sit. Yeah? I'm gonna have two minutes for have questions on this part of creating API. It uses, I don't know what's the name of this, but uh, whatever Facebook uses or uh, it's been posed to the world at that time is what it uses now. So she's having a structure with success, a data with the results, and whatever meta information you have in that comes afterwards. For example, you can have pagination debugging info, error messages, uh, for example, if you do uh, error, whatever, or JSON, you, you get stuff like that. Uh, the question uh, generally uh, most of it, is what is promoted in public place? What is in public place? I uh, think there is. No, uh, okay, I knew, I, I knew it was on <laughs> okay. I am against dependency injection containers. Oh. At least a global one. Actually, KPSP has many dependency injection containers across the code, but they're single purpose. So some work for tables, some work for components, some work for etc. So yes, you can compose applications and decouple them from anything else by implementing the right interfaces and using the right injectors. Yeah, yeah so that's not the uh, it's not talking just about injectors, but uh, when you write your application, but do you feel like you're being guided more towards something than to the right thing? You mean the coupling from the framework or no. from each other? It doesn't, it doesn't guide you to be decoupled from the framework because that is not our target audience. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't limit you. If you are confident enough as a developer and say, this part of the framework is, uh, I'm, I'm too coupling, I'm sorry. I'm coupling too much to this part of the framework. It would be better if I had an action plan, for example. That I just receive a response and a request, and that's it. Then yes allows you to do that. But all the practices that we told you to do is so that you can work faster. You have a framework, right? You cannot pay outside the framework because it's just part of it. That's why it's called a framework. It's not, it's not just PHP. But yes, if you see that your application is growing much bigger than KPSP, it does have the way to, to do that. for being such an interactive audience, which is uh, very rare. So, and thank you for having me here. Happy to answer questions. It was a pleasure. So,